So this message, you know, last week I, I made a few jokes and I, and I got in trouble. I, I even got a letter from somebody and this happens, this is my life. This is what happens to, to me all the time. And I, and I got in trouble and then I actually got convicted by the Holy Ghost. I got, I got, I got in trouble with God too last week. I, uh, I made a joke about this women's Bible study studying the book of Ephesians and I accidentally said the book of Ecclesiastes and then I said, but Ephesians is a lot more exciting. Then I felt bad for making that joke. And I went home and I got out the book of Ecclesiastes and I started to read it. And I, in the Holy Spirit, I'm not kidding you, he brought this scripture to my attention, Ecclesiastes 7.12, and it blessed my entire week and turned into this entire sermon that you're about to hear. Are you ready? This is my public repentance. The book of Ecclesiastes is quite exciting and very, good, very, very good. All right. For wisdom is... <laughs> <laughs> wisdom is protection. Did you get that? Wisdom is protection just as money is protection. Think about that. We save, we store up money for that, that rainy day. We have IRAs and savings accounts for our future, you know, retirement benefits. We think ahead, don't we? Because that's for our protection. That's for our family's protection. The Bible says wisdom is just like this. But the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the lives of its possessors. It preserves lives. That is so profound. And I want to know if you're ready to study some scripture with me today. Because I'm what you call an expository preacher, teacher. I like to teach everything based on scripture. And this sermon is chock full of scripture for your uh, blessing and for your development. So before I do that, I mean, I was thinking about we do all kinds of things for our protection, don't we? I mentioned, you know, saving up money. Uh, we buy insurance, don't we? We, we protect ourselves with insurance. We, we protect our lives. We protect our health, our, our homes, our, our vehicles. This church is insured. We do this for protection, we have warranty sometimes, or we pay for that extended warranty on our vehicle for our protection. I have a home warranty on, on our house, and I, I love it because it covers all the pool equipment above ground, which it always seems to break. It covers all my garage door openers. They break a lot. It covers the appliances, covers the garbage disposal. We use it all the time. I've told my wife, we can't afford to have this house without that warranty. It's for our protection. We take vitamins, some of us, we eat certain kinds of food, we exercise for our protection, we put alarms on our home, we put special cameras in our doorbells to watch that UPS guy on our front porch, don't we? We put locks on our custom wheels, some of us buy guns, mmm, we do. Some of us, you know, we, we wear helmets when we ride motorcycles, yes? Yes, we believe, even in a state that says you don't have to, I always wear a helmet for my protection. We have attack train schnauzers in our houses. The miniature ones, they're like little ninjas. You never see them, you never see them coming. We do all of these things for protection, but God said this. He said the best thing you can do to preserve your life is to possess wisdom. The best thing you can do above all of these things is to possess wisdom wisdom. I mean, be honest. As we look back at our crazy younger lives, how many unwise things <laughs> have we done? In fact, I took the word unwise and I translated it from the Greek. It actually translates to this word, teenager. <laughs> unwise translates, did you know that? It translates to, to teenager. And I've, and I've always said that that wisdom minus time is not wisdom at all. We learn from our mistakes, hopefully. We learn from, from experiences. Thank God for the chance to grow up. Thank God for the chance to mature. Thank God that we have this day to grow even more. Yes? And I know there's many, many winter visitors in this congregation. Would you please Raise your hands, snowbirds. We love you guys. Look at all these wise people who left the great north to come stay warm with us. Are you all using RVs? Most of you guys are RVers? Yeah, RVers. You know, RVers learn quickly that it's wise to know the difference between the gray water 
in the Blackwater valve in your motorhome. Who knows what I'm talking about? They have valves. They have two valves and one pipe coming out, and it, it matters that you know what gray water is out of your sink and what black water is. They should call it brown water. <laughs> Let's be honest. My dad, he loved these big diesel pusher motorhomes. He had some beauties, and he had this big 45-footer, and he pulled alongside of our house and outside of Fort Worth, Texas, when I was preaching out there for the winter, and something happened in a septic system from the, from the cold, and it, it was all kind of clogged up, and it wasn't working right, and he asked me to come out and, and to try to help him, and so I went out there, and I, I opened the big side door, and I pulled off that, that cap, and I opened the valves. Oh. Nothing happened. I got a stick. Oh. Trying to find out what the problem was. This is the, the epitome of unwise. <laughs> My father, unbeknownst to me, was inside with a, with a plunger trying to put pressure down while I'm underneath trying to put pressure up. And these things have enormous holding tanks. And it was like that movie Christmas Vacation. It was full and it exploded. It didn't trickle out, it exploded. I looked like Willy Wonka at the, at the chocolate factory. And my father, I'll never forget, is watching me through the window, and he said to me, I am so sorry. <laughs> I had to wash myself down with a hose in the freezing cold weather, take off my clothes outside, I freaked out the neighbors. <laughs> and I yelled to my dad, I'm going in the house for a shower, and then you're taking me for my favorite Mexican dinner. <laughs> True story, and he actually did that. We learn from our mistakes, hopefully. Now, the Bible talks about a, a foolish man who keeps returning to his folly like a dog returns to its vomit. And we just keep seeing people do the same things over and over, expecting a different result and nothing changes. That's called insanity, by the way. We don't want to be those kind of people. We want to put a pipe up, the Blackwater pipe, only one time in our lives, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. We don't want to keep going through the mistakes that we make in life. It's a proven fact that people, all of us, are seekers of, of happiness. Now, I'm not talking about hedonism where we're, we're pleasure seekers. I'm discussing that God has made us. Uh, we desire happiness, and, and this is a good thing. For us to desire happiness is a very healthy thing because in our, in our genuine quest for fulfilling happiness, these kind of scriptures that I'm about to share, they bear great truth. Proverbs 3.13. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. That man, the man who found godly wisdom, is a happy man. Proverbs 24.14. And I'm quoting from the, the NASB. And it's kind of a side note here. I've always, for all my career, I've been teaching from the NIV. And I have this, this old favorite NIV right in front of my, my keyboard on my desk. I look through it all the time. And then I, I find what I want to share with you guys. Then I go to Bible Gateway and I go to, to cut and paste what, I, what I've just read. And I'm starting to recognize that they've changed the NIV translation. It's not the same. And I feel like they've watered it down. I'm not happy at all with NIV translation. I, I'll get a letter from them next week. Here goes my next complaint letter from the NIV people, whoever they are. I'm now using a lot, uh, I'm reading from the NASB a lot. I've been told by my many great scholars that the NASB translation is among the greatest and the best and most respected of translations. Proverbs 24, 14. Know that wisdom is thus for your soul. If you find it, hang on, there's an if. There's always an if in the word of God. If you choose to seek wisdom, if you choose to do what is right, these blessings will follow. But we have freedom to choose. We can choose to keep putting a pipe or a stick up the black water pipe. We can never learn from those mistakes if we choose not to. If you find it, then you will have a future and your hope will not be cut off. In other words, godly wisdom provides for us a bright and hope-filled future. We need to seek wisdom, yes? So, are you lacking something? Are you... Are you longing for an internal peace, a, a peace within yourself? The Bible says this in Proverbs 19.8. He who gets wisdom loves his own soul. 
Now, this is not selfishness. This is telling us that if you seek wisdom, it's because you love yourself. You care about yourself. That's why you have sought after the wise things of God. He who keeps understanding will find good. The Bible says this, when you seek wisdom, you find life. You obtain favor from God. But the Bible says this as well. Those who miss wisdom injure themselves. Those who, who miss wisdom, who choose not to pursue godly wisdom, they bring injury upon themselves. The word says this, those people love death. Do you love life? The favor of God? Life and life more abundantly? That's God's promise. That's God's wisdom for you. Wisdom, according to scripture, is more valuable than gold. So, we all agree we need it. How do we get it? I can't find it on Amazon Prime. I looked. It's not there. <laughs> do we get wisdom from the local uh, bar on the, on the bar stool? Might learn some things from your mistakes, uh, school of hard knocks, but here's the words of, of Charles D. Lent. He said, wisdom never comes to those who believe they have nothing left to learn. Wisdom never comes to those who think they have nothing left to learn. And as a pastor, I, I can tell you that's very heartbreaking to, to deal with people who think they know enough already. Because the truth is, none of us do. As your pastor, I am a student of the word. I am a sponge. I'm always looking for the, na the next great breakthrough, the next great revelation, the light bulb to go off over the book of Ecclesiastes. These are exciting things for me to share with you. I'm always learning, always growing, always asking God to, to sharpen me and, and, and refine me. We should all be like that. If you think that you, you, you learned enough, you've studied scripture long enough, you've been to church your whole life, there's nothing left to learn, the Bible calls that unwise. Evan SR, he said this. He said, the disadvantage of becoming wise is that you realize how foolish you've been. And that's the truth. Wisdom helps us make right choices. The effective outcome and res <coughs> the effective outcome of, of everything we do, everything is steeped in godly wisdom. Everything, the choices we make, and here's what wisdom truly is. It's really comprised of these three components. This is wisdom. Knowledge plus understanding plus application. If you take any component back out, it's not wisdom. You might know something, uh, you, you might understand it, but you refuse to apply it to your circumstance. You keep on doing that foolish wrong thing and you keep coming back around to the same result and the same consequences and you just can't figure out why. Well, you're not using biblical godly wisdom. You know it, you understand it, now you do it. When the Bible tells us to not just simply be hearers, listeners of the word, but to be doers, God's referring to this right here. He wants to teach us things. He wants us to understand these things, and he wants us to change our ways and apply these things to our circumstances. So here's where godly wisdom truly begins. Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Not the fear like you're afraid of the boogeyman kind of fear, but this kind of fear, this word translates to reverence, respect for God's authority, for who God is. A good definition of, of godly wisdom, therefore, is found right here in Matthew, verse 7, 24, chapter 7, verse 24, in the words of Jesus. He said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a solid foundation. A wise man will hear the words of God, learn to understand the word of God, and then apply it, actually build his life on that principle or principles. Therefore, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of true wisdom, and listening to him is evident, it's fruit, that his wisdom is taking life and flight inside of you. His wisdom is percolating inside of you. So I brought you seven biblical truths today. Seven principles. And I found some of these in a book called Desiring God by John Piper. And I, I noticed one thing about this. You see, my heart's desire is to walk out here and to spend this a short burst of time with you and to truly 
be impactful, to truly make this meaningful and necessary and, and worthwhile that you came and you're glad and, and you're growing and that blesses your pastor to see that this is beneficial. And so to make this easier, I bring, I bring things for the screen. I encourage you to write notes and to take photographs and take these things home and mark up your Bibles. But every time I do this, I'm kind of taken aback by this fact that, that these principles I'm about to share are quite familiar. These principles are, are largely the same principles to solve all kinds of issues in, in our Christian experience. Number one, if you want to have wisdom in your life, you need to desire and pursue wisdom. You need to want wisdom with all of your heart. Proverbs 4.8, cherish her. Now, her is a metaphor for, for wisdom. Cherish wisdom, and wisdom will exalt you. Embrace wisdom, and wisdom will honor you. Godly wisdom will bring you honor. The second truth, principle, to having a growth in wisdom is this. No surprise. We need to apply ourselves to the study and the meditation of God's word. We make all kinds of excuses. We have all these good plans at the beginning of the year, these new journals and these new devotionals and the things happen and we just kind of push them aside. But you know the truth. Every time you begin your day in the word of God, that entire day always works better. It just does. Psalm 19.7, the law of God is perfect, refreshing to the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the people like me, the simple, making even a man like me wise in the ways of God. It's interesting. You can read a chapter, one chapter in the book of Proverbs every day, and there's just enough to last you for the month. Then you can start all over again. That's a wise first step in reading the Bible. And you're going to discover because every time you come back around to that exact same chapter, you're going to think, I'm going to recognize this, it's going to get boring. But no, because the Bible is the living word of God, you're going to find a fresh application and a new relevance to everything you read every time you come around for the rest of your life. You're going to find the living word of God bearing fruit by reading the same things every, every month, over and over again. And then read the rest of scripture. Read Ecclesiastes and Ephesians and everything around and in between. This is necessary. We cannot live well as Christians apart from the word of God. Amen. Third step in, in, in growing in our, in our Christ-like wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. Solomon was not born wise, yet the Bible calls him what? It calls him the wisest king. Now I have a little asterisk in my mind when I see the words wisest king because all of his actions weren't always wise. If you know the story of Solomon, he made a grave mistake with women. The wrong women. Wisdom is challenged by the wrong women. It's been going on for a long, a long time. So men and ladies, take note that when you operate in godly wisdom, you must practice those principles daily and not depart, even for a moment, like Solomon unfortunately did. But the scriptures tell us that, that Solomon was, was legendary. He was legendary in his, in his wisdom. There's, there's this one story that's so amazing about, about two prostitutes. And they, they both have little babies at the same time, and they're living together. And one of these ladies rolls over and suffocates her baby, and he died. And so in the middle of the night, she switched babies. She gave the other gal the dead baby. She took her, her living baby as her own. And the next morning, the other mom said, wait a minute, this is not my baby. And they wind up in this big dispute in front of King Solomon. And King Solomon said, hey, let's get a sword and cut that living baby in half right now. What? What kind of wisdom is that? And the real mom, filled with love and compassion for her child, she says, no, give the child to the other mother. And the king said, and you are the rightful mother of this child. That's Holy Spirit-fueled wisdom from God. God has that kind of wisdom on tap for all of us for asking. Solomon asked for it. He wasn't born with it. He asked God for the ability to discern, for the ability to lead. And God said, hey, because you're not asking for things for yourself, I'm going to give you what you ask. 
But God is so funny like this. You ask for the right things, he gives you all the things along with it. He blessed Solomon in all kinds of ways along with it. Lots of wisdom. Colossians 1.9, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that his spirit provides. You ask God for wisdom, his Holy Spirit is here in you to tell you and show you the wise. That's still small voice, that, that nudging that's telling you, but don't do this anymore. Don't open that valve like that. Don't, don't remember what happened last time. Don't do this. His spirit guiding us in the ways of wisdom. We need to ask him for wisdom. We need to apply it. Are you ready for this? Look at James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives it generously. But here comes the most peculiar part of this entire verse. He gives it generously to you without finding fault. What does that mean? So in other words, you ask God for wisdom. He's not going to blame you for asking him. Why would God mention that to us in his word? And I'll give you the answer. Because we are peculiar people, especially men. We are, we are arrogant. We are, we are proud. We are prideful. We have a hard time asking for help. We hate asking for directions. We have a hard time humbling ourselves before God. And God's telling us, hey, I want to help you. Just ask me for, for, for wisdom. Ask me for knowledge. And I'm not going to hold it against you. I'm not going to judge you for taking so long to ask me for help. But we're like this, aren't we, guys? You know, we are so, uh, maybe I'm just talking about me. I battle pride. And, I, and in my earlier days, especially in the early days of ministry, it was really a millstone around my neck. And there was times, I went to the Promise Keepers probably 22, 23 years ago, and I, and I didn't want to go to the Promise Keepers. I went because my friend needed to go. I went to make sure he got help. Ever done that? And while I'm watching a place filled full of 40,000 men worshiping God at one time, and then I watched this altar call, and I watched about 10,000 men filter out of the stands into the stadium floor and receive Christ. Here I was, this big gym owner at the time, stoic in stature, crying like a baby, not realizing all of this was part of a foreshadowing, a foretelling of my own future in ministry that I couldn't understand on that day. And it changed me. And I got holy ghosted there. I got, I got rattled there. I was a spiritual sideshow when I came out of that place. I was different. And one of the things they challenged us to do was to go home and pray with our wives. Now, I did the math last night. At that point, we'd been married about, I guess, 12, 13 years. And I had never prayed out loud in front of my wife. She never heard me pray to God. Why? I was too proud. I was, I was embarrassed to have her watch me ask God for help because I had all of the answers. I was a mover and a shaker. I got things done. And one time, when my life was going to, to heck in a financial handbasket in a bad business deal that was about to destroy us, I went to my knees in our bedroom and begging God for help, and Melissa walked in behind me. And what did I do? True story. I stopped praying. I pretended to be looking under the bed for something. <laughs> Oh, hey, there. Hey, there's that pencil. I lost it two years ago. That's my favorite pencil. Oh. True story. So now at the promise keepers, I'm being convicted. I go home and start praying with my wife. And I made God the promise that I would do it. And I tried to keep those kind of promises. And I went home and I said, Melissa, I've been convicted that I should be a spiritual leader in our home. I need to pray with you. We're going to pray together every night starting tonight. So a bedtime came and I'm a nervous wreck. I'm shaking. I'm sick to my stomach. I'm sweating. How weird is this? I'm your pastor. You want to get rid of me now? No. I don't blame you. Anyway, so I get on my knees next to my wife. I hold her by the hand and I ask God for help. I ask God for wisdom. I said, Lord, I have no clue how to do this. I don't feel good or comfortable in doing this. Will you please show me how to pray? Will you please show me what to pray about? And his spirit came over me and he led this most beautiful, eloquent prayer out of me my wife, for my family, for our circumstances. And when we were done, we were just 
holding each other and sobbing. I've been telling men now for 23 or 24 years, if you think the most intimate thing in your bedroom is sex, think again. Praying with your wife together in the company of the Lord is the most intimate thing you'll ever experience. And my wife and I have never stopped since that day. We pray together every single day. and Every single night we do that same thing and God is blessing us for it. Here's a funny fact for you. In Christian circles, marriages are ending in divorce six out of ten times, just like the rest of the world. But it's a proven fact. Couples who pray together, only one in 10,000 wind up in divorce. Think about that. Let this be life-changing information for you and for your family today. Men, take the lead. Start praying with your families. Do you believe that? Yes, I do. Why are you so quiet? Being convicted in this place today? Give God some glory in this house. Come on. Come on. It's almost over. <laughs> so if you're lacking in wisdom, ask God. He won't hold it against you. Don't be embarrassed. Lay down the pride. Go to the source of strength and help. There's only one God, only one place to go. Point number four quickly. If you like to grow in wisdom, hang out in the company of godly people. It's foolishness to get saved and to be enlightened by Christ and to keep going back into the ungodly circles that you escaped. It's great to testify. It's fine to witness, but you can't dwell. You can't linger in the past. There's no place for you there. You have a new mind now that's been changed by the Holy Spirit of God. Act like it. Live like it. Hang out with the godly. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. That's the word of God. It would be wise for all of you to walk out those doors and sign up for a small group in this church and spend one night a week in the company of godly people. People taking a sermon like this one and chewing on it and talking about it and learning from it and praying together and eating food, lots of food. They eat food all the time together. <laughs> Making me hungry thinking about these small groups right now. But be part of that family, part of that fellowship. That's wisdom, to seek the company of other godly people. Point number five, accept counsel from the wise. In Proverbs 24, 6, in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Ask God to show you. Even right now, is this pastor preaching truth? Are my words matching up with scripture? Then let the Holy Spirit show you how to apply these. Apply this wisdom to your life and to your circumstance. And that's point number six. Apply the wisdom. But that application, it's not wisdom at all. You've got to do it. You can't just think about it. You can't just talk about it, dream about it. It's time to actually do it. When you say to God, I need help. Give me the answer. Then you don't apply it. <laughs> You're going to find heaven becomes quite silent in times like those. Oh, pastor, I'm not hearing much from God anymore. And I always say, what was the last thing he told you? Where was the last place you spent time with him? What was the last leading that you had? Have you done it? Are you acting on it? It's time to go back to a different mountain to see what God has in store for you there. And finally, the seventh and final step is this. Value wisdom. Treasure wisdom. Honor wisdom. There's nothing more important than having Christ-centered wisdom in your life. You need it. Thomas Watson said this. He said, wisdom is the power to put our time and our knowledge to proper use. Without wisdom, we are wasting our lives. Without wisdom, the Bible says, we like misery. We like death. It's time to live God's way. Now, some people in the church, and this is a whole different sermon, but I just want to conclude with this thought. Some folks in the church confuse foolishness with faith. Well, the Lord led me to do this. Have you prayed about it? Have you checked it against scripture? Does it line up? Is it wise? Are you making a wise, sound decision? Well, I'm just stepping out in faith. I've seen and heard these reckless things all of my career. I've met people who told me this. Well, we met at church. It must be of God. Couples. You're married to somebody else. It's not of God. I promise you, this is not wise. This is going to end very, very badly for you. I've had this conversation countless times as a pastor. This is not of God. And here's the problem. We like to act reckless and blame it on our faith. God will get me through. 
You gotta get a job too. Say your prayers and apply for a job. If you want a blessing, a financial blessing. You can't just wait for the register to fall through the ceiling. Oh, hallelujah. Here comes my lotto ticket. So, so here's what I want to say. Wisdom does not put its hand into the bag of rattlesnakes and think that it will not be bit. Wisdom. Godly wisdom. Amen? Amen. Let's pray about that. Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for this word. Thank you for encouraging us in godly wise ways. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed watching that message as much as I enjoyed preaching it. If you want to see more things like this, well, well like it and subscribe to our channel. Meanwhile, we've placed a link in our description that'll take you right to Crossroads website to learn more fun facts about this fun-filled ministry. God bless you. We'll see you soon.